the most sublime and transcendent episode in the entire history of the World Trade Center would come in the first dark and difficult years after its opening. While the city lay deep in the worst financial crisis of its history, and while the towers themselves, still unfinished on the uppermost floors, seemed to stand as a painfully extravagant monument to folly and misguided ambition. For six years following his epiphany in the dentist's office in Paris, Philippe Petit had nurtured his dream, painstakingly perfecting his skills as a high-wire artist and devouring everything he could find about the Twin Towers. In early January 1974, he flew to New York City for the first time in his life to put in motion the next elaborate phase of the illegal escapade he now called simply the coup. He was 24 years old. When I came to New York, uh, it was winter, and I had a little journal or a little whatever. I, I wrote my thoughts, and I thought, uh, it's old, it's dirty, it's full of skyscrapers, I love it. That was my first little entry, the first day I saw New York. I remember my first encounter with the Twin Towers. I uh, got out of the subway, it was a long subway ride, and out of the darkness, I emerge at the base of, of one of the tower and look up and like a slap in the face, I saw that my dream was impossible. I mean, it's, it was right there in aluminum and glass and, and steel and concrete behind it. It was right there. It said impossible. And yet somehow I actually find myself trespassing over the plaza, still under construction and sneaking in one of the tower and climbing and climbing inside the building until I find myself very close to the top and until there were no more windows, no more partitions. They were just the skeleton, the beautiful steel columns and beams of the building. And uh, then I emerge, and there were no gates, there were nothing to protect you from the devouring void. And I stunned and I looked, and the second I look at the other tower, another time the word impossible etched itself inside me. But somehow I went back down and looked again from the street, and there I realized it's impossible, but I'll do it. And there was the beginning of a second wave of work, the, the real work, the work of getting into the building, not into uh, archaeological uh, findings or architectural magazines, but this time it was the monster, the beast, getting into the belly of the beast every day, which I did, hiding myself, disguising myself, sneaking, being caught, abandoning the project, going back to it for eight months, eight months in New York. And the towers, the more I got to know them, the more they become an ally. That's why when I say I conquered them, probably it's, it's wrong. I married them, <laughs> certainly. But they became my friends. It was 1974. And remember now, I had opened the tower at the end of 70. And I wanted public relations. I needed publicity. I had at least 10 million, 12 million square feet of space. And one day, a young journalist, he said he was, named Philippe Petit from France, showed up in my office with two photographer friends of his. These were his buddies. And, and he said, you know, I'd like to do an article on the World Trade Center. And I said, welcome, I, that's great. And naturally, I never asked, show me your credentials. And later on, I recognized that the subject always got back to how do those towers move in the wind. After eight months of false starts, last minute reversals, heartbreaking postponements, and maddening delays, the hour of the coup finally arrived. At six o'clock on the evening of Tuesday, August 6th, 1974, while one team made its way up into the North Tower, Petit, delirious with exhaustion and seething with the holy madness of his dream, slipped up to the top of the South Tower with two Confederates posing as delivery men in tow, carrying with them three heavy crates filled with equipment, including a disassembled balancing pole, wire for rigging, 250 feet of one-inch braided steel cable, and a bow and arrow. The first problem was how to pass the cable across, how to pass the first line, which will ultimately become a rope strong enough to pull the heavy steel cable. So. 
how to get that fishing line across. This is, this is like 200 feet uh, from center of roof to center of roof, roughly. We had all kind of ideas, and the idea that prevailed was the one I thought was ridiculous, it was a bow and arrow, but it actually worked. So with the fishing line and the bow and arrow, we passed uh, the first line across, and then all night uh, we pulled, and then the cable was secured. It took all night to complete the complex job of rigging, to anchor and secure as best he could the slender one-inch cable a quarter of a mile in the sky, across the 130-foot gap separating the two immense towers. 1,360 feet below, Wall Street was just beginning to come to life, when, at a little past seven, on the morning of August 7, 1974, Philippe Petit stepped out onto the slender thrumming wire that stretched across the immense shimmering void. Whenever other worlds invite us, uh, whenever we are balancing on the boundaries of our limited human condition, that's where life starts. That's where you start feeling yourself living. So when I found myself one foot on the wire, one foot on the building, and ready to decide to shift my way to become a bird, it was not something new. And uh, after a few steps, I, I knew I was in my element. I didn't even took the full length of the crossing to get to know the rigging and the vibration of the building and the wire. And then very slowly as I walked, I was overwhelmed by a sense of easiness, a sense of, uh, of simplicity. And actually I can be seen on the first pictures smiling, smiling probably out of disbelief. It's so easy after all those years and months of uh, ups and downs and detours, uh, victories and disasters. Finally, I was carrying my life on a path that was the simplest, the most beautiful and the easiest. Down on the street below, thousands of people on their way into work looked up in wonder and disbelief, transfixed by the sight of the tiny figure walking on air between the two towers. Somehow, uh, I found myself spending 45 minutes and doing eight crossings. There were thousands of people, at some point, 100,000 people. And actually, at some point, during these different crossings, I actually could hear my audience a quarter of a mile below. And I could hear them punctuating what I was doing on the wire. Let's say if I would uh, take a bow on one leg or salute the horizon or kneel in front of the tower to say hello to the tower, I would hear uh, almost with, a, with an echo the people cheering, screaming, applauding. I had in my car a radio that connected me to the police desk at the World Trade Center. And on a day in question, the light went on. And the patrolman at the police desk said, Mr. T, there's a problem in the World Trade Center. I said, what's the problem? He said, there's a guy walking on a tightrope between the two towers. What should we do? And I couldn't think of anything else. I said, don't let him fall off. And I hung up. So then I drove a little further. I called back. I said, by the way, this is incredible. Did somebody walk? If he doesn't fall off and he comes up, don't arrest him. Within minutes, police officers were dispatched to the roof of the South Tower. Sergeant Charles Daniels of the Port Authority Police never forgot the things he saw that day. Well, after arriving on the uh, rooftop, Officer Myers and I observed the uh, tightrope dancer, because you couldn't call him a walker, uh, approximately halfway between the two towers. And uh, upon seeing us, he started to smile and laugh, and he started going into a dancing routine on the high wire. He then went down to one knee, and uh, we stepped to the background, and I said for everyone to be quiet. And at this time, uh, he laid down on the high wire, and, uh, you know, just lackadaisically uh, rolled around on the wire. Like, he got up, he started walking and laughing and dancing, and uh, he turned around and ran back out into the middle. He was bouncing up and down, his feet were actually leaving the wire, and then he would resettle back on the wire again. 
unbelievably, really, to the point that we just, everybody was spellbound in the uh, watching of it. And I, I personally figured I was watching something that somebody else would never see again in the world. Thought it was once in a lifetime. During the, the walks, I had a sense of, of dancing on top of the world. I had a sense of having a communion with uh, the city of New York, represented by the crowd below. I had a sense of having stepped in otherworldly matters. And at some point in one of the crossings, I lay down on the wire and looked at the sky, and I saw a bird above me. And again, because of my sense were decupulated, I could see that bird pretty high up, and I saw uh, the eyes were red and uh, I thought of the myth of Prometheus there. Um, but the bird was circling and looking at me as if I was invading his territory, as if I was trespassing, which, which I was. So at some point I thought uh, the gods, <laughs> the god of the wind, the gods of the towers, the god of the wire, all those invisible forces that we persist in thinking they don't exist, but actually that rule our lives might become impatient, might become annoyed by my persistent vagabondage there. So my intuition told me uh, it was time for me to close the curtain of this, of this very intimate performance. It was, it was a, a walk between me and the towers, and I, I landed on the same tower from which I started, the South Tower, and then I had the, uh, the octopus of the authority, you know grabbed me by their hundreds of arms. When he came in off the wire, Petit was immediately taken into custody and rudely manhandled down into an underground police station deep beneath the South Tower, where he was formally charged with no fewer than 14 misdemeanors, including criminal trespass, disregarding police orders, reckless endangerment, and performing without a permit. Then he was besieged by an army of admiring reporters. Why did you do this? Um, that's the thousand uh, why this morning. There is no why. It's just uh, because uh, um, when, when I see a beautiful place to put my why, I cannot resist. W weren't you afraid up there at all? I, I was not afraid, but I was just um, no, looking what, what I have in front of me. I have really something which was huge and uh, incredible, you know. So afraid not, but uh, leaving more than a thousand percent. So perhaps that's close to a friend, I don't know. But at the same time, I was happy, 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 happy. You, you, you need uh, dreams to live. It's as essential as a road to walk on and as bread to eat. I would have feel myself dying if this dream would have been taken away from me by reason. The, the dream was as big as the towers. There was no way it could be taken away from me by authority, by reason, by destiny. It was really anchored to me in such a way that uh, life was not conceivable without doing this. The astonishing feat of high wire poetry was the highest point in Philippe Petit's life and, in many ways, in the life of the Twin Towers themselves. As Guy Tazzoli had predicted, the exploit was front page news around the country and around the world. And Petit himself became an instant folk hero, and nowhere more so than in New York. In the end, thanks in large part to Tazzoli himself, who personally interceded with the judge, all charges were dropped. And the 24-year-old Frenchman was sentenced instead to perform for a group of children in Central Park. Philippe Petit was the first person to humanize these things. You know, he put a human mark on them. He said, uh, I don't care about your architect and your plans for world trade. I'm gonna walk this thing. And there he did, doing this amazing feat in which the whole city applauded. Because, first of all, it took guts and skill but also it took these two buildings and he conquered them in some astonishing way that had the whole town cheering. But it was an astonishing moment. And after that, it never happened again. It's as if you did that once. It was not to be repeated. 
fabulous, you know, it's just that, that this guy had done this and it made the towers belong, if you would, more to New York. Petit himself would never lose his deep love for the towers. In honor of his achievement, the Port Authority presented him with a free lifetime pass to the observation deck on the South Tower, where, on a bright windswept afternoon, not long after his historic walk, he signed his name in indelible ink on a steel beam overlooking the vast canyon where he had danced among the clouds. In the years to come, he would return to the high perch whenever he could, trying without success to relive the amazing walk in his mind and hoping to catch a glimpse one more time of the valiant seagull he had once seen sailing high above him a quarter of a mile in the sky. It never came.